years ago, there was only one member of Congress who had the courage to vote against the war in Afghanistan. Uh, she was the Congresswoman uh, from Oakland, California, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. This was the speech that she gave on the floor of the House of Representatives at that lone vote. Mr. Speaker, members, I rise today really with a very heavy heart, one that is filled with sorrow for the families and the loved ones who were killed and injured this week. Only the most foolish and the most callous would not understand the grief that has really gripped our people and millions across the world. This unspeakable act on the United States has really forced me, however, to rely on my moral compass, my conscience, and my God for direction. September 11th changed the world. Our deepest fears now haunt us. Yet I am convinced that military action will not prevent further acts of international terrorism against the United States. This is a very complex and complicated matter. Now this resolution will pass, although we all know that the President can wage a war even without it. However difficult this vote may be, some of us must urge the use of restraint our country is in a state of mourning. Some of us must say, let's step back for a moment, let's just pause just for a minute and think through the implications of our actions today so that this does not spiral out of control. Now, I have agonized over this vote, but I came to grips with it today, and I came to grips with opposing this resolution during the very painful, yet very beautiful memorial service. As a member of the clergy so eloquently said, as we act, let us not become the evil that we deplore. Thank you, and I yield the balance of my time. And joining us right now is Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Uh, Congresswoman, glad to have you back on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Uh, first and foremost, um, when you see when you see those video clips uh, from this weekend, when you see the terror in the eyes of people, uh, when you see uh, the desperation trying to get out of that country, um, what was going through your mind? I, I, I'm feeling right now like I felt on um, September 14th, 2001, uh, devastated in so many respects, Roland. Uh, these people. Uh, our troops for 20 years have done everything we asked them to do. The Afghan allies, the, the people who supported the U.S. presence in Afghanistan, uh, they're uh, under threat of death. Uh, our American diplomats, uh, our citizens, NGOs, businesses, you know, it, it's terrifying what's taking place. But I, I have to tell you, we have got to do everything we can do. And that's what I'm thinking about now is how do we uh, in my capacity as chair of the subcommittee that funds a lot of our uh, visas, special immigrant visas, and all of the uh, diplomatic and uh, development uh, stools of our foreign policy, what I can do more to help this administration with these evacuations, because we have got to do something. Uh, people are desperate. They're dying. They're hanging onto planes. Uh, this is uh, untenable. And so that's how I'm feeling right now. That's what I'm working on day and night. And also, of course, uh, you know, I, I hope everyone recognizes that um, there's no military solution in Afghanistan. And the president's absolutely correct in, in his decision and what he did. But the movement out and the planning was, uh, in many respects, uh, short of disastrous. So how do we resolve this particular issue here? Uh, there are a lot of people, obviously, um, who are concerned about the treatment of women in Afghanistan. Um, but we also are dealing with, uh, there are numerous countries where we can be angry and disagree with human rights violations. Look what's happening in uh, Myanmar right now, what's happening uh, in uh, Malaysia, the Prime Minister resigned, what's happening in, you know, in other countries. And so how, how do we deal with that where our presence kept uh, the Taliban from being in control, but the option really was, do you stay there for the next 100 years, or do you simply say, 
Afghanistan, you've got to take control of your country. We can't be big brother for forever. Look, we can't nation build um, it, bro, at all. This is an example of a presence, a military presence, where there is no military solution attempting to nation build. We owe the people of Afghanistan support from after uh, we invaded the country and uh, did everything that we did. Our soldiers did everything that this country asked them to do. So we owe them uh, a debt of, of gratitude by helping them with the development with the women's with women's education, women's empowerment, everything schools, you know, everything that we needed to do to help them. But we should not have been there for 20 years as a military uh, occupation, Roland. And so, yes, we stand for human rights throughout the world, but we can't nation build. And so wherever there are violations of human rights, we need to say so and we need to engage in the me mechanisms that uh, would encourage these violations of human rights to stop. But we cannot uh, occupy a country militarily when there's no military solution. And then now, as with Afghanistan, we see what's happened when you do occupy a country for 20 years. There's no military solution. Now we're faced with a, a, a terrible disaster. And so we need to really learn the lessons of Afghanistan and know that, you know, Congress has been missing in action. I've been trying to get Congress to revisit this blank check that was given. And Congress has to really put some uh, restraints on military adventures around the world. That has nothing to do with protecting our national security. The president can always use force if our national security is at threat. He has that responsibility and duty under the Constitution. But Congress authorizes the use of force, and we have to do that very uh, selectively, targeted, so we don't end up where we are today in other countries. Uh, last question for you before I go to my panel and each one of them ask you a question. Um, what does it also say that this nation uh, had no problem, Congress had no problem spending $2 trillion in Afghanistan? But say God that again, forbid, Rowan. Say uh, that again. Talk about spit. I said, I said, what do we say to folks when Congress had no problem spending $2 trillion in Afghanistan, but God forbid want to put together a program of $2 trillion to actually spend uh, in uh, American cities where you're dealing with the poor and impoverished, where you're dealing with uh, high rates of infant mortality. What does it say that this country has no problem spending that type of money when it comes to the military, but when we talk about non-military, then all of a sudden it's all oh, we can't afford these things. Mm -hmm. Says a lot about our priorities, but it also says a lot about why so many people are living on the edge in this country and why we have now a military budget of over $740 billion, which is excessive. We have enough resources, a budget uh, in the military that could warrant a 10 to 15 percent cut right now, which would invest 75 to 80 billion dollars in uh, human infrastructure, building our own nation helping people who have been shut out and marginalized for so long. So people need to rise up and say, stop it. You know, we have other tools in our toolbox, Roland. You know, I chair the subcommittee on appropriations that is responsible for a $62 billion budget for diplomacy and development. But yet the, the defense spending is $740 billion. It's totally out of balance. And so the public, we have to educate the public so people know they have to make sure their members of Congress understand that they're not going to tolerate this military first uh, Pentagon spending budget at the expense of their uh, quality of life, but also it's not at, at the expense of our national security. So we've got to make sure members of Congress don't be, don't, are not afraid of reducing the military budget because that's the only way we're going to bring some sanity into our uh, federal budget and our priorities. Questions for my panelists. I'm going to start with Oma Congo. Your question for Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your courage and, and bravery. It, it's been amazing to, to watch over the years. I, I wanted to know what do you feel going into 2022? What is the best way for us as just regular citizens to keep the pressure on Congress to make sure that some of the things that you've been talking about are actually taking place, particularly when you talk about reallocation of the budget, education issues, and just getting them to prioritize what should be happening in our country that's not. Sure. Thank you so much for that question, because that is the question, how we hold elected officials accountable in between elections. And I don't see enough 
African Americans and people of color lobbying their members of Congress, saying no, do not vote for this, or yes, vote for that. And so we have to have a, a lobby operation going on, a people's lobby, you know, that holds members of Congress and other elected officials accountable to promises that they make during the elections, but also to public service, to what they need in terms of their daily lives. I mean, this, they pay ta people pay taxes regardless. And so we, some of those tax dollars should come back to our communities for schools, for housing, for health care, for climate uh, change initiatives, uh, energy efficient initiatives, and for job creation. And so you, you can't just elect people and let them go at it. You have to hold them accountable each and every day. I ha hear from my constituents, let me tell you, I always say my district is one of the most enlightened districts in the country because I hear from them each and every day about issues like, this is important. I, we know this vote's coming up. What do you think about it? How are you going to vote? We engage constantly. And that's what people need to do with their elected officials. Thank you. Uh, Avis, your question. Congresswoman, wonderful to see you. Um, How are you? As horrible as this situation is, the aspect of it that worries me the most is what will happen to the women and girls who are left in Afghanistan. And for all intents and purposes, their livelihoods will be sort of banished back to the Stone Age. Um, what do you think we can do at this point um, to, in some way, uh, help to provide some humanitarian help uh, to the women and girls who have been left behind? Sure. And let me tell you, that uh, terrifies me also. And I've worked over the years on supporting the Afghan women through a variety of programs and, and funding priorities. And to see now a moment where the women of Afghanistan are going to have to go back into uh, the dark ages is, is morally wrong. It's offensive and it's tragic and it's dangerous. And so we have to do everything we can do. And I'm glad that the president uh, talked about every dime in terms of humanitarian assistance, development assistance, but we've got to work now with the international community because if the Taliban is the governing body, uh, if they're running the government in, in Afghanistan, how in the world do we engage diplomatically with the Taliban? And so we're going to have to have a, an international strategy, one now, right now, for the protection of women and girls. We've got to evacuate uh, the women uh, especially those who have been activists, who've been speaking out, who have been leading on so many fronts. We've got to protect them, look out for their security and safety immediately. That's the immediate uh, emergency that we have to address. But long term, we have to come together with the world and figure out how in the world we're going to protect women and make sure that the gains that they have uh, achieved continue and also protect them because we know the Taliban and we know how ruthless they are. So it's, it's something the world has to come to grips with and develop uh, a strategy around. Michael Brown, your question for Congresswoman Lee. Congresswoman, how are you? Hi, hi Michael. Good to see you. I see you look the exact same as you did in 2001. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I um, five you know, you, you, later, so thank you. <laughs> you you're welcome. You had mentioned um, diplomacy, and if you if you were on one of the diplomatic teams, how do you use diplomacy with a group of folks that are hard to trust, that either lie or don't give the full story or don't tell you where people are hiding or if they're if they're abetting folks? How how do you deal with folks that you you want to in good faith trust? But you can't. Well, yeah. I, I don't like to quote. I guess it was Ronald Reagan, but it was trust and verify. Trust verify, and verify. Right. Yeah. I think right. it's extremely important. And, and I don't even, in, in my work on the Hill, I'm not going to say I trust my colleagues. <laughs> there may be a few that I might trust, but I don't trust it, hardly anyone, because you know what the deal is. But you have to figure out how to work together, and you have to determine paths forward in your common interests. And so you have to establish some rules of engagement and you have to be able to verify that those rules are being complied with. But uh, in, in, world, in the diplomatic world, in the political world, uh, trust is not, uh, I think, a concept that you 
can engage in like you do per perhaps in your personal life. I mean, you have to be able to work with people and to believe that they're going to live up to their part of the deal. And I'm glad, again, going to President Biden, that's what he's doing, living up to his part of the deal. What he said he was going to do, he's doing. So you have to uh, believe people will do the right thing based on your agreements and your engagement with them. So I don't think trust is the exact proper term or concept when you're engaging in international um, politics. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. All right, Congress, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, we we'll certainly appreciate uh, you joining us. Uh, we will be watching closely what happens in Afghanistan over the, Afghanistan over the next few days. Thank you. Nice being with you, Rowan. Take care of yourself. Folks, back to our Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Uh, Seek.com. We are partnering with them, of course. Uh, we appreciate their support right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, check out uh, a couple of their uh, products uh, that you can take advantage of. Please let the music play. Enjoy the uh, Seek.com video by using one of their uh, virtual reality headsets. All you do is just pop your phone right here uh, into the VR headset and enjoy the content. Uh, you can also uh, take advantage of uh, their 360-degree uh, headphones. Uh, these headphones here uh, come in a couple of colors, black and gold, but then also uh, all gold. And so uh, you can uh, check these out if you want to use our promo code uh, to get a discount. Uh, it's RMVIP21, RMVIP21. Uh, then, of course, a, a portion of the proceeds comes back to Roland Martin Unfiltered, uh, which allows for us to fund the show. And so uh, this is a black-owned company. We certainly believe uh, in supporting black-owned companies. Uh, Barry Spio is the founder. Uh, and so, again, go to Seek.com and use the promo code RMVIP21.